So, good day. What I wanted to share to you today is about the research guide for and specifically for types of research design. And uh, everybody are aware that we have a lot of types of research design. Types of research design. So, before beginning your paper, you need to decide how you plan to design the study. The research design refers to the overall strategy that you choose to integrate the different components of the study in a coherent and logical way, thereby ensuring you will effectively address the research problem. It's, uh, it constitutes the blueprint for the collection, measurement, and analysis of data. Note that the research problem determines the, the, the type of design you should use, not the other way around. General structure and writing style. The function of a research design is to ensure that the evidence obtained enables you to effectively address the research problem logically and as unambiguously as possible. In social science research, Obtaining information relevant to the research problem generally entails specifying the type of evidence needed to test a theory, to evaluate a program, or to accurately describe and assess meaning related to an observable phenomenon. With this in mind, a common mistake made by the researcher is that they begin their investigations far too early before they have thought critically about what information is required to address the research problem. Without attending to these design issues beforehand, the overall research problem will not be adequately addressed and any conclusion drawn will run the risk of being weak and unconvincing. As a consequence, the overall validity of the study will be undermined. I have here the length and complexity of describing research design in your paper. It can vary considerably, but any well-developed description will achieve the following. Number one, identify the research problem clearly and justify its selection, particularly in relation to any valid alternative designs that could have been used. Number two, review and synthesize previously published literature associated with the research problem. That's why it is always advisable to each and everyone, especially to the researcher, to read and search a lot of literature related to what you wanted to discuss or to research. Clearly and explicitly specify hypotheses central to the problem, such as the research question, of course. Effectively describe the information and or data which will be necessary for an adequate testing of the hypothesis and explain how such information and or data will be obtained and describe the methods of analysis to be applied to the data in determining whether or not the hypotheses are true or false. We need to take note that the research design is usually incorporated into the introduction. You can get an overall sense of what to do by reviewing the literature of studies, as I mentioned, that have utilized the same research design. This can provide help you develop an outline to follow for your own paper. We need also to take note, use the SAGE research methods online in cases in the SAGE research methods videos. Databases to search for scholarly resources on how to apply specific research design and methods. 
the research methods online database contains links to more than 175,000 pages of sage publishers book journal and reference content on quantitative qualitative and mixed research methodologies also included is a collection of case studies of social research projects that can be used to help you better understand abstract or complex methodological concepts the research method videos the database contains hours of tutorials interviews video case studies and many mini documentaries covering the entire research process again try to visit sage research methods online and cases and the sage research methods videos okay the number one types of research design is action research design what will be the definition and purpose of action research design the essentials of action research design follow a characteristic cycle whereby initially an exploratory stance is adapted where an understanding of a problem is developed and plans are made for some form of interventionary strategy then the intervention is carried out during which time pertinent observations are collected in various forms so either action and action research the new interventional strategies are carried out and his cyclic process repeats continuing until a sufficient understanding of the problem is achieved so or valid implementation solution for the protocol is iterative or cyclical in nature and is intended to foster deeper understanding of a given situation starting with conceptualizing and particularizing the problem and moving through several interventions and evaluation now what to what do these studies tell you so it means to say that how about action research design number one this is a collaborative and adaptive research design that lends itself to use in a work or community situations number two design focuses on pragmatic and solution driven research outcomes rather than testing theories take note of it focuses on pragmatic and solution driven research outcomes rather than testing theories number three when practitioners use action research it has the potential to increase the amount they learn consciously from their experience the action research cycle can be regarded as a learning cycle number four action research studies open have direct and obvious relevance to improving practice and advocating for change and number five there are no hidden controls or preemption of direction by the researcher so what these studies don't tell you in doing actual research it is harder to do than conducting conventional research because the researcher takes on responsibility of advocating for change as well as for researching the topic number two an action research is much harder to write up because it is less likely that you can use a standard format to report your findings effectively example data is open in the form of stories or observations Number three, personal over-involvement of the researcher may bias research results. Number four, the cyclic nature of action research to achieve its twins at outcomes of actions or change and research or understanding is time-consuming and complex to conduct. And number five, advocating for change usually requires buy-in from study participants. 
The next one, of course, is the case study design. The next type of research design is the case study. The definition and purpose. A case study is an, is an in-depth study of a particular research problem rather than a sweeping statistical survey or comprehensive comparative inquiry. It is often used to narrow down a very broad field of research into one or few easily researchable examples. The case study research design is also useful for testing whether a specific theory and model actually applies to phenomena in the real world. It is a useful design when not much is known about an issue or phenomenon. What do these studies tell you? Or what do this case study tell you? Number one, approach excels at bridging us to an understanding of a complex issue through detailed contextual analysis of a limited number of events or conditions in their relationships. Number two, a researcher's or researcher using a case study design can apply a variety of methodologies and rely on a variety of sources to investigate a research problem. Number three, design can extend experience or add strength to what is already known through previous research. Number four, social scientists in particular make wide use of this research design to examine contemporary real-life situations and provide the basis for the applications of concepts in theories and the extension of methodologies. And number five, the design can provide detailed descriptions of specific and rare cases. What this case study don't tell you. Number one, it is very challenging to us or to the researcher to use case study because a single or a small number of cases offers little basis for establishing reliability or to generalize the findings to a wider population of people, places, and things. Intense exposure to the study of a case may bias a researcher's interpretation to the findings. Design does not facilitate assessment of cause and effects relationships. Vital information may be missing, making the case hard to interpret. Number five, the case may not be representative or typical of the larger problem being investigated. Number six, if the criteria are sele for selecting a case is because it represents a very unusual or unique phenomenon or problem for study, then your interpretation of the findings can only apply to that particular case or cases. The next type of research design is a causal design. Causal design or causality studies may be thought of as understanding a phenomenon in terms of conditional statements in the norm or in the form if x then y. This type of research is used to measure what impact of a specific change will have on existing norms and assumptions. Most social scientists seek causal explanation that reflect tests of hypotheses. Causal effect occurs when variation in the open in the open or one phenomenon an independent variable leads to or results on average in variation in another phenomenon or the dependent variable the conditions necessary for determining causality number 1 empirical association it is a valid conclusion is based on finding an association between the independent variable and the dependent variable. We have also appropriate time order for, for these conditions of causality. It means to conclude that causation was involved 
one must see that cases were exposed to variation in the independent variable before variation in the dependent variable. The last is Nan's furiousness, a relationship between two variables that is not due to variation in a third variable. What do these studies tell you? Or what do this causal tells you? Or then, causality research design assess or assist researchers in understanding why the world works the way it does through the process of proving a causal link between variables and by the process of eliminating other possibilities. Number two, replication is possible for causal design. In number three, there is greater confidence the study has internal validity due to the systematic subject selection and equity of groups being compared. So what this casual design don't tell you? Number one, the casual design don't tell you that not all relationships are causal. The possibility always exists that by sheer coincidence, two unrelated events appear to be related. Number two, conclusion about causal relationship are difficult to determine due to the variety of extraneous and confounding variables that exist in a social environment. This means causality can only be inferred and never proven. Number three, if two variables are correlated, the cause or the must come before the effect or the cause must come before the effect. However, even though two variables might be causally related, it can sometimes be difficult to determine which variable comes first and therefore to establish which variable is the actual cause and which is the actual effect. The next, of course, is the cohort design. The definition and purpose of the cohort design, often used in a medical sciences, but also found in the applied social sciences. A cohort study generally refers to a study conducted over a period of time involving members of a population which the subject or representative member comes from and who are united by some commonality or similarity. Using a quantitative framework, a cohort study makes note of a statistical occurrence within a specialized subgroup united by same or similar characteristics that are relevant to the research problem being investigated rather than studying statistical occurrence within the general population. Using a qualitative framework, cohort studies generally gather data using methods of observation. Cohorts can be either open or closed. Open cohort studies or the dynamic population such as population of, for example, Philippines, involve a population that is defined just by the state of being a part of the study in questions and maybe it is being monitored for the outcome. Date of entry and exit from the study is individually defined. Therefore, the size of the study population is not constant. While in open cohort studies, researchers can only calculate rate-based data, such as incidence rates and variance thereof. For the closed cohort studies, of course, static population such as patient entered into a clinical trial involves participants who enter into the study at one depending point in time and where it is presumed that no new participants can enter the cohort. Given this, 
the number of study participants remain constant or can only decrease. What do these studies tell you? Number one, the use of cohorts is often mandatory because a randomized control study may be unethical. For example, you cannot deliberately expose people to asbestos. You can only study its effects on those who have already been exposed. Research that measures risk factors often relies upon cohort designs. Number two, because cohort studies measure potential causes before the outcome has occurred, they can demonstrate that these causes preceded the outcome, thereby avoided the debate as to which is the cause and which is the effect. Number three, cohort analysis is highly flexible and can provide insight into effects over time and related to a variety of different types of changes, either social, cultural, political, or economic, and others. Number four, either original data or secondary data can be used in this cohort design. What these cohort design studies don't tell you? In cases where a comparative analysis of two cohort is made, especially for your stud studying the effects of one group exposed to, for example, uh, COVID-19 and one that has not, a researcher cannot control for all other factors that might differ between the two groups. These factors are known as compounding variables. Number two, cohort studies can end up taking a long time to complete if the researcher must wait for the conditions of interest to develop within the group. This also increases the chance that key variables change during the course of the study, potentially impacting the validity of the findings. Validity is lower than that of study designs where the researcher randomly assigned participants. The next type of research design is a cross-sectional design. The definition and purpose of the cross-sectional research design have three distinctive features. Number one, it has no time dimension. Number two, a reliance on existing differences rather than change following intervention. Number three, groups are selected based on existing differences rather than random allocation. The cross-sectional design can only measure differences between or from among a variety of people, subjects, or phenomena rather than a process of change. As such, researchers using this design can only employ a relatively passive approach to making casual inferences based on findings. What do cross-sectional design studies tell you? A cross-sectional studies provide a clear snapshot of the outcome and the characteristic associated with it at a specific point in time. Number two, Unlike an experimental design, a cross-sectional design where there is an active intervention by the researcher to produce and measure change or to create differences, cross-sectional designs focus on studying and drawing inferences from existing differences between people, subject, or phenomena. Number three, it entails collecting data at and concerning one point in time, while long, longitudinal studies involve taking multiple measures over an extended period of time, a cross-sectional research is focused on finding relationship between variables at one moment in time. Number four, 
group identified for study are purposely selected based upon existing differences in the sample rather than seeking random sampling. Cross-section studies are capable of using the data from a larger number of subjects and, unlike observational studies, is not geographically bound. It can estimate prevalence of an outcome of interest because the sample is usually taken from the whole population. In number seven, the cross-sectional design generally use survey techniques to gather data, they are relatively inexpensive and take up little time to conduct. What these studies don't tell you? Finding people, subjects, or phenomena to study that are very similar except in one specific variable can be difficult. Number two, results are static and time-bound and therefore give no indication of a sequence of events or reveal historical or temporal context. Number three, studies cannot be utilized to establish cause and effects relationship. Number four, the cross-sectional design cannot be utilized to establish cause and effects as I mentioned earlier. This cross-sectional design only provides a snapshot of analysis so there is always the possibility that a study could have differing results if another time frame had been chosen. And number five, there is no follow-up to the findings. Next will be the most commonly used, the descriptive design. The definition in the purpose of descriptive research design helps provide answers to the questions of who, what, when, where, and how associated with a particular research problem. A descriptive study cannot conclusively ascertain answers to why. Descriptive research is used to obtain information concerning the current status of the phenomena and to describe what exists with respect to variables or conditions in a situation. So what do these studies tell you or what do this descriptive design tell you? The subject is being observed in a completely natural in unchanged natural environment. Through experiments, whilst giving analyzable data open adversely influence the normal behavior of the subject. Number two, descriptive research is often used as a precursor to more quantitative research design with a general overview giving some valuable pointers as to what variables are worth testing quantitatively. If the limitations are understood, they can be a useful tool in developing a more focused study. Descriptive studies can yield rich data that lead to important recommendations in practice. In number five, approach collects a large amount of data for detailed analysis. What this study don't tell you. In descriptive design, the results from, uh, from this cannot be used to discover as definitive answer or to disprove a hypothesis. Because descriptive design often utilizes observational methods, the results cannot be replicated. And the descriptive functions of research is heavily dependent on instrumentations for measuring or measurement and observation.
the next type of research is most commonly used for an IT or ITE or information technology practitioner or information system field. The definition and purpose or even for some HRM or nursing or different field actually. A blueprint of the procedure that enables the researcher to maintain control over all factors that may affect the result of an experiment. In doing this, the researcher attempts to determine or predict what may occur. Experimental research is often used where there is time priority in a causal relationship or the cause precedes effect. There is consistency in a causal relationship. A cause will always lead to the same effect. And the magnitude of the correlation is great. The classic experimental design specifies an experimental group and a control group. The independent variable is administered to the experimental group and not to the control group. And both groups are measured on the same dependent variable. Subsequent experimental designs have used more groups and more measurements over longer periods. True experiments must have control randomization, and manipulation. What do these studies tell you? Experimental research allows the researcher to control the situation. In so doing, it allows researchers to answer the question, what causes something to occur? It permits the researcher to identify cause and effect relationship between variables and to distinguish placebo effects from treatment effects. Experimental research designs support the ability to limit alternative explanation and to infer direct causal relationship in the study. And last, approach provides the highest level of evidence for single studies. What these studies don't tell you? The experimental design is artificial and results may not generalize well to the real world. The artificial settings of experiment may alter the behaviors or responses of participants. The experimental design can be costly if special equipment or facilities are needed. Some research problems cannot be studied using experiment because of ethical or technical reasons. D difficult to apply ethnographic and other qualitative methods to experimentally design studies. The next will be the exploratory design. The definition and purpose of exploratory design. An exploratory design is conducted about a research problem when there are few or no earlier studies to refer to or rely upon the predict and outcome. The focus is on gaining insights and familiarity for later or later investigation or undertaken when research problems are in a preliminary stage of investigation. Exploratory designs are often used to establish an understanding of how best to proceed in studying an issue or what methodology would effectively apply to gathering information about the issue. What will be the goal of exploratory research are, research are intended to produce the following possible insights. In exploratory design, familiarity with basic details settings in concern, well-grounded pictures of the situation being developed, generation of new ideas and assumptions, development of tentative theories or hypotheses, determination about whether a study is feasible in the future, issues get refined for more systematic investigation and formulation of new research questions, and direction of future research and techniques get involved. What do these studies tell you? 
The exploratory design is a useful approach for gaining background information on a particular topic. Exploratory research is flexible and can address research questions of all types, what, why, and how. It provides an opportunity to define new terms and clarify existing concepts. Exploratory research is often used to generate formal hypotheses and develop more precise research problems. In the policy arena, or applied to practice, exploratory studies help establish research priorities and where resources should be allocated. What these studies don't tell you? Exploratory research generally utilizes small sample sizes and thus findings are typically not genera generalizable to the population at large. The exploratory nature of the research inhibits an ability to make definitive conclusions about the findings. They provide insights but not definitive conclusions. The research process under, underpinning exploratory studies is flexible but value to decision makers. Design lacks rigorous standards applied to methods of data gathering and analysis because one of the areas for exploration could be to determine what method or methodologies could best fit the research problem. The next will be the field research design. Definition and purpose of field research design, sometimes referred to as ethnography or participant observation, designs around field research encompass a variety of interpretive procedures or observation and interviews rooted in qualitative approaches to studying people individually or in groups while inhabiting their natural environment as opposed to using survey instrument or other forms of personal methods of data gathering. Information acquired from observational research takes the form of field notes that involves documenting what the researcher actually sees in hers while in the field. Findings do not consist of conclusive statements derived from numbers and statistics because field research involves analysis of words and observation of behavior. Conclusions, therefore, are developed from an interpretation of findings that reveal overriding themes, concepts, and ideas. What do these studies tell you? The field research is often necessary to fill gaps in understanding the research problem applied to local conditions or to specific groups of people that cannot be ascertained from existing data. The research helps contextualize already known information about a research problem, thereby facilitating ways to assess the origins, the scope, and the scale of problem, and to gauge the causes, consequences, and means to revolve an issue based on deliberate interaction with people in their natural inhabited spaces. It enables the researcher to corroborate or confirm data by gathering additional information that supports or refutes findings reported in prior studies of the topic. Because the researchers embedded in the field, they are better able to make observations or ask questions that reflect the specific cultural context of the setting being investigated. Observing the local re reality offers the opportunity to gain new perspectives or obtain unique data that challenges existing theoretical propositions or long-standing assumptions found in the literature. So what these studies don't tell you? A field research study requires extensive time and resources to carry out the multiple steps involved with preparing for the gathering of information, including, for example, examining background information about the study site, obtaining permission to access the study site, and building trust and rapport with subjects. It requires a commitment to staying engaged in the field to ensure that you can adequately document events in behavior as they unfold. The unpredictable nature of fieldwork means that researcher can never fully control the process of data gathering. 
They must maintain a flexible approach to studying the setting because events and circumstances can change quickly or unexpectedly. Findings can be difficult to interpret and verify without access to documents and other source materials that help to enhance the credibility of information obtained from the field. Example, the act of triangulating the data. Linking the research problem to the selection of study participants inhabiting their natural environment is critical. However, this specificity limits the ability to generalize findings to different situations or in other contexts or to infer courses of action applied to other settings or groups of people. The reporting of findings must take into account how the researcher themselves may have inadvertently affected respondents in their behaviors. The next will be historical design. The purpose of historical dis research design is to collect, verify, and synthesize evidence from the past to establish facts that depend or refute a hypothesis. It uses secondary sources and a variety of primary documentary evidence such as diaries, official records, reports, archives, and non-textual information such as maps, pictures, audio and visual recordings. The limitation is that the sources must be both authentic and valid. What do these studies tell you? The historical research design is unobtrusive. The act of research does not affect the results of the study. The historical approach is well suited for trend analysis. Historical records can add important contextual background required to more fully understand and interpret a research problem. There is open no possibility of researcher subject interaction that could affect the findings and historical sources can be used over and over to study different research problems or to replicate a previous study. What these studies don't tell you? The ability to fulfill the aims of your research are directly related to the amount and quality of documentation available to understand the research problem. Since historical research relies on data from the past, there is no way to manipulate it to control for contemporary context. Interpreting historical sources can be very time-consuming. The sources of historical materials must be archived consistently to ensure access. This may be especially challenging for digital or online-only sources. Original authors bring their own perspectives and biases to the interpretation of past events and these biases are more difficult to ascertain in historical resources. Due to the lack of control over external variables, historical research is very weak with regard to the demands of internal validity. It is rare that the entire entirety of historical documentation needed to fully address a research problem is available for interpretation. Therefore, gaps need to be acknowledged. The next is longitudinal design. Longitudinal design. A longitudinal design or a study follows the same sample over time and makes repeated observation. For example, with longitudinal surveys, the same group of people is interviewed at regular intervals, enabling researchers to track changes over time and to relate them to variables that might explain why the changes occur. Longitudinal research design describe patterns or change of change and help establish the direction and magnitude of casual relationship. Me measurements are taken on each variable over two or more distinct time periods. This allows the researchers to measure change in variables over time. It is a type of observable or observational study, sometimes referred as a panel study. What do these studies tell you? 
longitudinal data facilitate the analysis of the duration of a particular phenomenon. It enables survey researchers to get close to the kinds of causal explanation usually attainable only with experiments. The design permits the measurement of differences or change in a vari variable from one period to another. And of course, uh, the description of patterns of change over time. Longitudinal studies facilitate the predictions of future outcomes based upon earlier factors. What these studies don't tell you? The data collection method may change over time. Maintaining the integrity of the original sample can be difficult over an extended period of time. It can be difficult to show more than one variable at a time. This design often needs qualitative research data to explain fluctuations in the results. A longitudinal research design assumes present trends will continue unchanged. It can take a long period of time to gather results, and there is a need to have a large sample size and accurate sampling to reach rep representativeness. Next is meta-analysis design. Meta-analysis is an analytical methodology designed to systematically evaluate and summarize the results from a number of individual studies, thereby increasing the overall sample size and the ability of the researcher to study effects of interest. The purpose is to not simply summarize existing knowledge but to develop a new understanding of a research problem using uh, synoptic reasoning. The main objective of meta-analysis include analyzing differences in the results among studies and increasing the precision by which effects are estimated. A well-designed meta-analysis depends upon strict adherence to the criteria used for selecting studies and the ability of information in each study to properly analyze their findings. Lack of information can severely limit the type of analysis and conclusions that can be reached. In addition, the more dissimilarity there is in the results among individual studies, the more difficult it is to justify interpretations that govern a valid synopsis of a results. A meta-analysis needs to fulfill the following requirements to ensure the validity of your findings. Because validity is very important in our research design. In meta-analysis, clearly we need to clearly define description of objectives, including precise definitions of the variables and outcomes that are being evaluated. A well-reasoned and well-documented justification for identification and selections of the studies. Assessment and explicit acknowledgement of, a re of any research bias is the identification and selection of those studies. Description and evaluation of the degree of heterogeneity among the sample size of studies reviewed. And justification of the techniques used to evaluate the studies. What do these studies tell you? The meta-analysis design can be an effective strategy for determining gaps in the literature. It provides a means of reviewing research published about a particular topic over an extended period of time and from a variety of sources. It is useful in clarifying what policy or programmatic actions can be justified on the basis of analyzing research results from multiple studies. It provides a method for overcoming small sample sizes in individual studies that previously may have had little relationship to each other. And meta-analysis design can be used to generate new hypotheses or highlight research problems for future analysis or studies. What these studies don't tell you or what this or what meta-analysis design studies don't tell you. A 
small violations in defining the criteria used for content analysis can lead to difficult to interpret and A large sample size can yield re reliable but not necessarily valid results. A lack of uniformity regarding, for example, the type of literature reviewed, how methods are applied, and how findings are measured within the sample of studies you are analyzing can make the process of synthesis difficult to perform. Depending on the sample size, the process of reviewing and synthesizing multiple studies can be very time-consuming in a meta-analysis design. Mixed method design. The mixed method research represents more of an approach to examining a research problem than a methodology. Mixed method is characterized by a focus on research problems that require an examination of a real-life contextual understanding, multi-level multi perspectives, and cultural influences. An intentional application of rigorous quantitative research assessing magnitude and frequency of constructs and rigorous qualitative research exploring the meaning and understanding of the constructs and an objective of drawing on the strengths of quantitative and qualitative data gathering techniques to formulate a holistic interpretive framework for generating possible solutions or new understanding of the problem. The Shakuri and Criswell and other proponents of mixed methods argue that the design encompasses more than simply combining qualitative and quantitative methods, but rather reflects a new third way, epistemological paradigm that occupies the conceptual space between positivism and interpretivism. What do these studies tell you? A mixed method design Narrative and non-textual inform information can add meaning to numeric data, while numeric data can add precision to narrative and non-textual information. It can utilize existing data while at the same time generating and testing a grounded theory approach to describe and explain the phenomenon under study. A broader, more complex research problem can be investigated because the research is not constrained by using only one method. The strengths of one method can be used to overcome the inherent weaknesses of another method. It can provide stronger, more robust evidence to support a conclusion or set of recommendations. It produces more complete knowledge and understanding of the research problem that can be used to increase the general generalizability of findings applied to theory or practice. What these studies don't tell you? In mixed method design, a researcher must be proficient in understanding how to apply multiple methods to investigating a research problem, as well as be proficient in optimizing how to design a study that coherently melds them together. It can increase the likelihood of conflicting results or ambiguous findings that inhibit drawing a valid conclusion or setting forth a recommended course of action. So, for example, a sample interview responses do not support existing statistical data. Because the research design can be very complex, reporting the findings requires a well-organized narrative, clear writing style, and precise word choice. Design invites collaboration among experts. However, merging different investigative approaches and writing styles require more attention to the overall research process than studies conducted using only one methodological paradigm. Concurrent merging of qual quantitative and qualitative research requires greater attention to having adequate sample sizes. Using comparable samples, applying, of course, a consistent unit of analysis. For sequential design, 
where one phase of qualitative research builds on the quantitative phase of by or vice versa. Decisions about what results from the first phase to use in the next phase. The choice of samples and estimating reasonable sample sizes for both phases. And the interpretation of results from both phases can be difficult. Due to multiple forms of data being collected and analyzed, this design requires extensive time and resources to carry out the multiple steps involved in data gathering and interpretation. Next is the observational design. This type of research design draws a conclusion by comparing subjects against control group. In cases where the researcher has no control over the experiment, there are two general types of observational design. In direct observation, people know that you are watching them. Unobtrusive measures involve any method for studying behavior where individuals do not know they are being observed. An observational study allows a useful insight into a phenomenon and avoids the ethical and practical difficulties of setting up a large and cumbersome research project. What do these studies tell you? Observational studies are usually flexible and do not necessarily need to be struct structured around the hypothesis about what you expect to observe. It means that data is emergent rather than pre-existing. The researcher is able to collect in deep information about a particular behavior. It can reveal interrelationship among multi multifaceted dimensions of group interactions. And you can generalize your results to real-life situations. Observational research is useful for discovering what variables may be important before applying other methods like experiments. Observation research designs account for the complexity of group behaviors. What these studies don't tell you. Reliability of data is low because seeing behaviors occur over and over again may be a time-consumed task and are difficult to replicate. In observational research, findings may only reflect a unique sample population and thus cannot be generalized to other groups. There can be problems with bias as the researcher may only see what they want to see. There is no possibility to determine cause and effect relationship since nothing is manipulated. Sources or subjects may not all be equally credible. And any group that is knowingly studied is altered to some degree by the presence of the researcher, therefore potentially skewing any data collected. Next will be the philosophical design. Understood more as a broad approach to examining a research problem than a methodological design, philosophical analysis and argumentation is intended to challenge deeply embedded, open and tractable assumptions underpinning an area of study. This approach uses the tools of argumentation derived from philosophical traditions, concepts, models and theories, or critically explore and challenge, for example, the relevance of logic and evidence in academic de debates. To analyze arguments about fundamental issues or to discuss the root of existing discourse about a research problem. These overarching tools of analysis can be framed in three ways. Number one or is ontology. 
The study that describes the nature of reality, so for example, what is real and what is not, what is fundamental and what is derivative. Another is epistemology. The study that explores the nature of knowledge, for example, by what means does knowledge and understanding depend upon and how can, be, can we be certain of what we know. And another is anthology. The study of values, for example, what values does an individual or group hold and why? How are values related to inter, uh, interest, desire, will, experience, and means to end? And what is the difference between a matter of fact and a matter of value? What do these studies tell you? The philosophical design can provide a basis for a applying ethical decision-making to practice. It functions as a means of gaining greater self-understanding and self-knowledge about the purposes of research. It brings clarity to general guiding practices and principles of an individual or group. The philosophy informs methodology. It refines concepts and theories that are invoked in relatively unreflected unreflective modes of thought and discourse. Beyond methodology, philosophy also informs critical thinking about epistemology and the structure of reality or the metaphysics. It offers clarity and definition to the practical and theoretical uses of terms, concepts, and ideas. What these studies don't tell you? The philosophical design limited application to specific research problem is just answering the so what questions in social science research. Analysis can be abstract, argumentative, and limited in its practical application to the real life issues. While a philosophical analysis may render problematic that which was once simple or taken for granted, the writing can be this dense and subject to unnecessary jargon, overstatement, and or excessive quotation and documentation. There are limitations in the use of metaphor as a vehicle of philosophical analysis. And there can be analytical difficulties in moving from philosophy to advocacy and between abstract thought and application to the phenomenal world. Next will be the sequential design. Sequential research is that which is carried out in a deliberate stage approach, or serially, where one stage will be completed, followed by another, then another, and so on with the aim that each stage will build upon the previous one until enough data is gathered over an interval of time to test your hypothesis. The sample size is not predetermined. After each sample is analyzed, the researcher can accept the null hypothesis, accept the alternative hypothesis, or select another pool of subjects and conduct the study once again. This means the researcher can obtain a limitless number of subjects before making a final decision whether to accept the null or alternative hypothesis. Using a quantitative framework, a sequential study generally utilizes sampling techniques to gather data in applying statistical methods to analyze the data. Using a qualitative framework, sequential studies generally utilize samples of individuals or groups of individuals or cohorts and use qualitative methods such as interviews or observations to gather information from each sample. What do these studies tell you? In sequential design, the researcher has limitless option when it comes to sample size and the sampling schedule. Due to the repetitive nature of this research design, Minor changes and adjustment can be done during the initial parts of the study to correct and hone the research method. This is a useful design for exploratory studies. 
there is very little effort on the part of the researcher when performing this technique. It is generally not expensive, time-consuming, or workforce-intensive. Because the study is conducted serially or sequential, sequentially, the results of one sample are known before the next sample is taken and analyzed. This provides opportunities for continuous improvement of sampling and methods of analysis. What these studies don't tell you. The sampling method is not representative of the entire population. The only possibility of approaching representativeness is when the researcher chooses to use a very large sample size significant enough to represent a significant portion of the entire population. In this case, moving on to study a second or more specific sample can be difficult. The sequential design cannot be used to create conclusions in interpretation that pertain to an entire population because the sampling technique is not randomized. Generalizability from finding is therefore limited. It, of course, this uh, sequential design is difficult to account for and interpret by variation from one sample to another over time, particularly when using qualitative methods of data collection.